Welcome to a new episode of Technoculture. I'm your host, Federica Bressan, and today my guest is Heidi Karine Brimi, a Viking Age archaeologist, CEO and co-founder of Hands on History, a resource bank for cultural heritage dissemination and interpretation based in Trondheim, Norway. Welcome, Heidi. Thank you for being on Technoculture. So today's topic is living history, a unique approach to educating people on cultural heritage. Living history was inspired by historical reenactment, but it differs from it because participants do not play specific roles and they do not stage any particular historical event. They are themselves, and it's all about dressing like, for example, the Vikings, and leaving all modern technology behind, smartphones, plastic bottles, even toilet paper, and adopting Viking technology, what they used in their daily lives, knives, cups, and so on. The idea is to live like that for a period of time and get a direct experience of what it was like to be a Viking, how life was then. This is very interesting for technoculture, because even if we are mostly interested in digital technology, what we are trying to do is fundamentally the same exercise. We try to understand what it means to be human today, and this requires a reflection on our technology, our habits, the things we take for granted. It's an interesting experiment to strip ourselves of today's technology and travel back in time to another era and see if it's true that adopting a different technology changes how we think, how we act, ultimately how we see the world. Hands on History is specialized in Viking-themed living history experiences. Heidi, can you tell us what the idea behind Hands on History is? Uh, we wanted to do something that were stripped down and real. Because when you see reenactment uh, groups going to uh, medieval fairs or Viking festivals, uh, they often bring a lot of gear with them. Uh, they have beds, they have tents, they have tables and chairs and all kinds of their cutlery, everything. Not a lot of cutlery for the Viking Age, but nevertheless, it's a lot of items, a lot of gear and a lot of comfort. We wanted to do the opposite thing. Uh, how would people travel if you were crossing a mountain range, going hunting, uh, going from A to B on foot? What did you do? Uh, how did they manage? What kind of equipment did they need? How did they think about their journey? This is a time, a thousand years ago, there were no roads, no infrastructure of any kind like we have today in Scandinavia. So uh, we wanted to experience the past times in a very direct way with all the senses and the emotions, the joys and fears, the freezing at night, <laughs> the joy of getting there, everything, the journey, the whole journey and do it the proper way. And to do that, we had to get rid of a lot of these comforts we usually have at festivals and markets. So we figured out it's hard to travel through boggy Norwegian mountains because they are boggy <laughs> and, and the forest as well uh, if you have too much to carry. So we only take what we really, really need with us. So almost all the items and all the gear we have with us is multi-purpose. Uh, we don't bring a bowl and a cap. We bring a bowl. Uh, we don't, of course, have a fork. We have a knife and we have a spoon. And we bring one axe. We don't bring one axe each, but we bring one axe for the group. And we divide the food we are going to eat between us. Uh, so we share the load. And we don't bring a tent. We only have a tarp. It's just a piece of cloth. We have treated it with some uh, fat and also some... Uh, linseed oil to make it more sturdy against the wind and the rain in case it rains uh, and we sleep on uh, one reindeer pelt and we have one blanket each like the one we are sitting on now yes they're wonderful aren't they <laughs> very warm <laughs> yes 
So you're trained as an archaeologist. When did you first get the idea of living history and of giving other people the direct experience of living history, which in a way seems to share some aspects with historical reenactment? It comes from reenactment, the idea of recreating all this gear and try to figure out what were they're using, what were the most logical approach to to what we're trying to do and of course the archaeological material isn't that big we don't have a lot of clothing uh, we don't have a lot of kitchen where it's of course we have the Oseberg find but it, it's not a lot we don't know a lot about the daily life of the vikings so what we're really doing we're not recreating we are doing living history We're putting life into the history and trying to use whatever small finds and archaeological evidence and sometimes also historical evidence. Sometimes people are writing things in texts that we can use. The Vikings didn't write anything themselves, but people wrote about them and some people wrote down their stories. So, but it's not a lot to go on. It's not a much more material from the medieval times. So what we do, we call it living history. And for me personally, <laughs> not for, for the rest of uh, Hansen history, but for me personally, this interest in archaeology and in the past lives, it started as a child. I loved Indiana Jones. <laughs> <laughs> and I loved walking in the forest. And I remember my grandfather used to tell me all these fairy tales about the, the fairies of the forest and the trolls and how people were living in where there was no electricity. And it's, it's this dream of the past. And this is how it started for me. And it led to me uh, studying archaeology. But it also led to a lot of LARPing. <laughs> Uh, I still do LARPing, but I don't have a lot of time for it. But that were both uh, fantasy LARPs, uh, of course, but also historical LARPs. We had Viking Age LARPs, where we tried to recreate a society and making a compendium for the players who were not experts in Viking Age. Excuse me. Can you explain what LARP is? Yeah, LARP is live action role playing. So it's like if you play cowboys and Indians or pirates or whatever. It's it's the same, but it's like you're playing Vikings or you're elves and bards and whatever. If it's a fantasy setting, it could be sci-fi, it could be anything. So it's you're making your, your own fairy tale as you go. No manus, no, no written down about uh, what's going to happen, but... Uh, You make the story yourself. You're playing a part and you make the story. But that's not what we're doing in hands-on history. We don't play. We, we are ourselves. We are modern people. But we are traveling back in time to experience in every kind of sense how it was a thousand years ago. And to do that, we need to get away from civilization. And that's why we're hiking. You can't do this in a park or in a city or places where people with a lot of modern clothes and cars and, and modern housing and things modern noises. So we've gone to great lengths to find places that are suitable for this kind of experience. And you you went with us today to one of these small places we found very close to the city. And it's so quiet up there. You can't hear traffic. You can't hear anything. It's just us, the nature and the view of the fjords and the mountains. I absolutely loved it. And I have to thank you very much for taking the time to come out here with me and to dress me up and to walk me into the woods and tell me all these beautiful stories. I got a taste of what the participants have when they join one of your trips, which is normally one week long. So living history is fun, but it's not just all about having fun. This is a legitimate approach to getting some knowledge about a different lifestyle through the practical experience of changing the technology that surrounds you, including the clothes, and creating this time bubble, detaching yourself from the modern world. How large is this phenomenon? Do other people do it around the world? And what is unique to hands-on history? I don't know of other people offering the same experience as we do. Because when we go on these hikes in the mountains, we tell people to leave their cell phones behind. 
because it, it's a very disturbing element. You're not going to live in the Viking Age if you're going checking on Facebook. It doesn't make any sense. It kind of destroys the time bubble we're trying to make. So we do bring a camera, of course. One of us, the guides, do that and take a lot of pictures because pictures are very important. People want to relive their experience and they also uh, want to look good. Uh, people look very epic in the mountains in Viking Age clothes. <laughs> <laughs> and they feel epic, of course, and that's the whole point. You, you, and, and then people are kind of... Uh, they are almost euphoric when they came when they come back from uh, the, these hikes, and they they're also exhausted because it's a rough hike in the mountains, and it's cold and it's long. And when you make camp, it takes about two hours before dinner is ready because you have to make a fire and you have to cook dinner. And we use flint and steel to make a fire. We do it the proper way, so uh, everything is like it should be. And these things takes a lot of time and it makes a contrast to modern life. A lot of things we take for granted. You have to take your time with getting food, with moving, with walking, uh, setting up camp. And yeah, all these things that we take for granted, you just put on the stove or, or put a pizza in the oven and call your friends or just go to bed, take a shower and it's, the water is hot and comfy and you have a towel and the mm. room is heated. <laughs> it's very different to skinny dip in an Arctic lake mm. <laughs> without a towel. <laughs> How important is it in living history to be historically accurate? Uh, for us, it's very important. Uh, we try to do things as historical accurate as possible. And as I said, sometimes it's, it's an, what we call it an educated guess because we don't have a lot of material on some of these things. Like what kind of backpacks do they use? <laughs> we don't have a lot of backpack finds from the Viking Age. It's just about a two, 250 years period. So it's, it's not a long time. So we have to improvise. We do that. But we tell people what kind of finds the bowls we use. They're made from finds from Birka in Sweden. The clothes are um, mostly from Skjoldehamn. It's a uh, find in, from Norway, the north of Norway, about a thousand years ago, the end of the Viking Age. And also the food is based on the grave finds and uh, we also use the seasons This time of the year, it's too early for apples. We're in early August, and the apples in Norway and in this part of Norway, they aren't, they, they're not ripe yet. So we have dried apples, <laughs> of course, and the vegetables, everything. It's uh, this, it's of the season. Is there anything that has revealed itself to you? Something you have learned while hiking about a piece of equipment or about a habit, a custom, just because of the practical experience and that shed light on a particular aspect of the Viking life or their technology? We're testing it. <laughs> it's just field testing. It's not, uh, it's not like experimental archaeology because we don't do this... Uh, the scientific tests on the material, but we do the test for practical purposes. We want to know if this will function. So we did quite a few uh, test hikes with equipment and it ended up like how little can we bring with us? <laughs> Because uh, it was quite obvious that you don't want to bring anything you don't need. But you need to bring some essential things. You need to make a fire, you need an axe, you need a knife, you need a bowl and you need some food that won't spoil. And you need something to sleep on. And the reindeer pelts are just wonderful for that. They're so insulating and warm. But the Vikings were not nomads. No, no, they so were farmers. So it's not all about traveling, moving. They also had settlements. Yes, they were a farming community. And they did trade with the Sami people in Scandinavia. And they were hunter-gatherers, uh, hunting the reindeers and other animals as well. But the Vikings uh, are what... The Europeans called the Vikings, the people living up here, uh, were farmers and fishermen and also traders. But sometimes they were raiders, of course. But there's a lot more to that history and just raids. Can you describe what we are wearing right now? For example, what did you put on me today? Yeah, uh, you have um, a hood. Uh, it's made from a uh, fine at Skjoldehamn. 
in the north of Norway. It was a grave find. The person was found with fully clothed within some blankets. And uh, the hood was, uh, this is a copy of the hood of that, that person. And so is uh, the tunic. And the tunic is a very, uh, it's a very simple uh, form of tunic. You find it throughout Europe in the Viking Age and also in medieval times. It's the basic tunic uh, with some extra width uh, to, to down, it goes down to your knees. And we have the trousers. Uh, the trousers are uh, from Torsberg. They are from uh, a Danish find. A little before the Viking Age, actually, I have to be honest about that. <laughs> we don't have a lot of Viking Age trousers. And there are also the, the band, uh, the leg wraps. They're just common leg wraps to, to protect your legs from the moist. And when you, you're hiking through the Norwegian forest and the mountains, there's a lot of undergrowth. So the leg bands is quite useful when it's wet. It doesn't get your legs wet and it keeps you warm. And I'm wearing a belt with some things attached. So they did not have pockets? No, they used bags and uh, pouches. So we have a belt and a small knife. And that's it. <laughs> How far back in time are we traveling today? What is the time frame of the Viking Age? Oh, yes. Viking Age is... Uh, normally said to have started when we have the first written record of a Viking raid. It was on Lindisfarne at the end of the 8th century. Uh, it ends at the beginning of the 11th century and all the Scandinavian countries, uh, Norway, Denmark and Sweden, also Iceland eventually, uh, become Christianized. And that marks the end of the Viking Age. So it's a period of about 250 years. So it's not a very long period in time, in history. And after the Viking Age, from about 1030, 1050, you start to get the modern European Christian monarchies and countries. And that evolves into what we see today. But Norway started to take its form in the Viking Age as a country. Yeah, so the Vikings were never wiped away as a people. So their culture was never removed. They turned into what eventually uh, became modern Norwegian society. So there must be elements of the Viking culture that survive today. Do we know of these elements of Viking culture that are still present in the language or maybe in some customs of Norwegian culture? Yeah, I think it's more than we think of. A lot of things in the language, of course. It's so funny because the Vikings spent a lot of time in England or in the, the British Islands. And a lot of the English language has been uh, influenced by the Vikings, like the word for bag. It's bagar. That's a Norse word. And everything connected to ships and sailing and seafaring, those are based on Norse words. And of course, in Norway, we still use them. So it's a part of our language. And also, if you're telling someone to get away from here or you get out of my sight, we say, it means go to the seas. <laughs> and that's kind of get away, go, go out to the sea and get lost. That's what we're saying. Uh, but also in um, our culture, when we celebrate Christmas, we don't call it Christmas, we call it Jul. And Jul is the midwinter feast from pagan times. So it's an old Norse word. We still use it in Scandinavia. In old Scandinavian countries, use the word Jul instead of Christmas. Of course, Christmas is uh, very close to the 21st of uh, December. It's when the sun turns. So uh, it's a midwinter feast. And the way we celebrate it also is quite similar with the feasting. And uh, so, so we have some, some remnants of it. That there's also an old habit uh, or old tradition in Norway connected to Christmas. When you take this Christmas, we call it the Christmas band, you take this bundle of uh, wheat axes or something like that, or barley or whatever uh, from, from the fields. And you bundle it together and you hang it out for the birds to eat. But that's an ancient pagan tradition where you had to spare the last part of the acre or the, um, the field because the spirit of the field was hiding in it. So you had to spare the last part. And it turned into the Christmas, the, the thing we hang out for the birds in Christmas. So things like that. But also the Norwegian farmer 
at how we look on a family's land, it's inherited. Uh, we have this uh, tradition called odelsrätt, and it means that um, you can't sell the family's farm, you have to inherit it. If you inherited the farm, you can't sell it because there will be someone else who have the right to inherit it. And this still goes on now. And lots and lots of things. Uh, uh, I'm thinking of uh, the law system <laughs> in Norway. The assemblies in the Viking Age, where, where they used to, to gather to solve disputes, the local assemblies and regional assemblies, they were called a ting. Uh, the parliament in Norway is called a stor ting. It means a big thing. <laughs> Not in ting like an item, but a ting, it's an assembly. Yeah, And we still have this um, court system. Uh, with different regions having their own things. And we call it the Ting Court. It's uh, the first court in Norway. So it's the same system. It was kind of put into word in the early medieval times, but it dates back to the Viking Age and perhaps even further. We don't know. As I said, the Vikings themselves they didn't write anything down. Everything was told. So uh, there was this lawman who knew the laws and uh, all the stories, the sagas, everything was told, uh, the myths of the gods and everything. It was just vocal. Oral, Oral yeah. Uh, who called them Vikings? Yeah, the Vikings didn't call themselves Vikings. No. It was the Europeans who started to call them that uh, after a while. And uh, we see it in the early medieval texts. And the sagas and the Norse myths were written down in the medieval times, mostly by monks. A lot of them in Iceland. The monasteries in Iceland wrote down a lot of these sagas, these uh, family sagas of Scandinavians, but especially from the Icelandic. And some Icelandic big shots, they also paid the monks to put in words they own their own family sagas. And we also have some historians like Snorri Sturlason, he was also an Icelandic. He wrote down the sagas of the kings, uh, for instance. So he's quite a famous saga writer of the Scandinavians, uh, Snorri Sturlason. Are people that join your time travels required to do some background research? Do you need prior education to enjoy or to make the most of this type of experience? Uh, you don't need any anything, not really. But of course, if you know something about it, it would be uh, a lot more easy to, to kind of ask questions and to, to get more knowledge about it. Uh, but we do require people to be in good health because they need to hike for about 25 kilometers in the terrain with unusual backpack and gear. They're not used to it. And it may it may be bad weather. It can be cold, it can be rainy. So we need people to be fit and to, to handle hike because we don't walk in... It's not paths, like level paths. This is terrain walking. It's uh, rough, rocky, bumpy. <laughs> I guess that... Everyone knows at least something about the Vikings just because they are omnipresent in popular culture. We have movies and TV series. So there must be people that come to your hikes and think they know something about the Vikings. But there must be false beliefs and things that are not historically accurate. What would you say is the most common misconception? <sighs> Well, there's a lot of misconceptions about the Viking Age. Uh, I think it's fairly common knowledge now that the Vikings didn't have horns on their helmets. <laughs> that that myth comes from a, a 19th century German opera. Really? Yeah, they needed some Vikings that looks that had to look very scary, so they put horns on their helmets. So Wagner put horns on Vikings' heads? Yeah, there's something like that. It's uh, had nothing to do with the Viking Age. They didn't have horns on their helmet. I think we only found about one or two helmets from the Viking Age. But, of course, uh, people look at movies and at popular shows, TV shows, and they think that, oh, this is it, this is how it was. But they have to take some, uh, what do you call it, artistic freedom or to to make things look nice in movies if you have a battle for instance if everybody was dressed like uh, common people you wouldn't see who is who and probably if you had a battle in the viking age that was the case and you have to mark people but in the movies then you have someone with brown clothes and someone with black clothes and it's a lot easier for the spectators to see the difference but also this myths about there's an ongoing debate if the vikings had tattoos we have no certain source for that. We have some 
half sources that can be an interpreted like they had tattoos, but we're not really sure. Nobody used the word tattoos on the Vikings. They did never have mohawks. I just had to say that. <laughs> and the color black isn't that easy to achieve if you're going to make some wool to color it or the leather. Uh, one source from uh, the Viking Age, a French source, called the Vikings for peacocks because they had a lot of color on the clothes and they wore a lot of jewelry and they liked to uh, to brush their hair and they bathed once a week. They were not dirty people. They had this. They needed to keep themselves. Uh, they were, yeah, we find a lot of uh, personal grooming gear in the graves, like picking out nose hairs and uh, cleaning your ears, air spoons and combs, things like that. So they liked to look good and they used bright colors. So they didn't mind standing out. And I repeat, they didn't have mohawks. <laughs> <laughs> That's the take-home message from this podcast episode. But is there anything that popular culture gets right of all the things that it shows us about the Vikings? A lot of the material culture you see in the films and at the festivals and at the markets, they are replicas. So they give a good impression of the material culture and the environment they had on the farms, for instance, when they had a daily life. But this myth about the Vikings being these savage raiders, there's a lot more to them than that. Uh, and I will make absolutely no excuses because they were savage raiders. They did a lot of harm down in Europe, but there's a lot more to the Viking culture. And we want to experience more of the daily life and uh, other aspects. So you will never see hands on history fighting. <laughs> Other people do that uh, more, better than we would do. Um, we want to have daily life and everyday people uh, at our focus to experience what it would be like for a person living in the Viking Age, not a Viking warrior, because a few persons were Viking warriors. Most people stayed at home, tended their farms, uh, had children and uh, looked after the cattle and tried to stay alive. That was what life was most, most about. So that's what we're doing. How powerful, educational, transformative an experience with living history can be. What are the aspects that surprised you the most or your participant the most? Some things that people say, I didn't expect this. Or I thought this would be harder. This is better than I thought. What are some small revelations that emerge during this experience? Yes, I think it's uh, on the Go Viking hikes we have in hands-on history, it's mostly about the simplicity and the lack of um, complicated gear. As I told you, it's just a bowl and a spoon and a knife and some food. It's very, very simple what we bring with us. But this works. It really, really works. And it works just as well if you go hiking in modern clothes. I don't freeze more and I'm not more hungry and I'm not more exhausted if I hike in Viking Age gear and than if I hike in modern gear with Gore-Tex and whatnot. <laughs> a tent. <laughs> so there wasn't much comfort, we think. But when you try it, it turns out, okay, there is comfort here, but it's a different kind of comfort, but you really, really appreciate it. And there's also this slowness about hiking in the Viking Age uh, manner. When you have no cell phones, nobody knows what time it is. <laughs> and you're just going to go from A to B. And you're going to set up camp and you're going to make some food and then you're going to sleep. And nothing is there to disturb you. There's no modern technology. You don't see any houses. There's no uh, vehicles, no cars, no nothing. Just you and nature and the little gear the few items you brought with you, but that's enough. Mm -hmm. So with living history, we go back in time and we learn about, for example, the Viking Age, but we also learn something about ourselves because when we come back, so to speak, we see things differently. So maybe participants at the end of the week, they have also learned something about today's lifestyle. Yeah, 
they I, I think they appreciate a hot shower a lot more <laughs> after have been skinny dipping in the Arctic lakes. The, the the temperature in the lakes are like 13 degrees. It's not very hot. And also all the things you take for granted, all the things you don't need at all. Because when you go on these Viking hikes, you need everything you bring with you. You don't have one thing you don't need. The only thing I bring that I usually don't use is the first aid kit, because we do think of safety, of course. So we have means for contacting the modern world if somebody breaks a leg <laughs> or falls off a cliff. And we never had any accident like that, but it's good to be safe. The mountains can be a very dangerous place and during the Viking Age and also in medieval times and right up until the 19th century when modern tourism started to take off. It started to, the mountains and the forests were considered a very dangerous place for good reason. I would like to thank you for being on Technoculture and most of all for the incredible experience of the hike in the beautiful Norwegian woods. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I'm delighted to be invited to your podcast. It's uh, It's been a very fun experience and uh, I hope it has been so for you. Unforgettable. Thank you for listening to Technoculture. Check out more episodes at technoculture-podcast.com or visit our Facebook page at Technoculture Podcast and our Twitter account, hashtag Technoculture Podcast. <laughs>